Joining us now is Jeff Mulgan. He's the author of The Locust and the Bee, Predators and Creators in Capitalism's Future. And he is also, oh, Jeff, I'm just about to mess this up. He's the chief executive of the Nesta Foundation? That's right, yeah. Oh, well, all right, great. I didn't mess it up. So uh, you have a bo- the book that I've just mentioned, uh, The Locust and the Bee, uh, where you have an argument I think in some respects, in, in my view, about kind of different brands of capitalism or different ways of going about capitalism, um, and two are distilled really in the title of your book. What is locust capitalism and what's bee capitalism? Well, first of all, what the book came from was an attempt to understand what was happening around the crisis 2008 onwards. So I've got a background which has been sometimes working in business and technology, where I work now, we invest in companies and also back NGOs, and I've worked in, in governments around the world. And I was trying to make sense of what the origins of the crisis were, but more importantly, how we found our way out. And for me, part of the key came in trying to distinguish both the positive and the negative behaviors of capitalism, which I argue are inherent to how it's, it's always been. Uh, and indeed, I went back to Adam Smith for these uh, definitions. Adam Smith, who's often thought of as just a a proponent of free markets, if you read his early writings, he was much more sophisticated than that. He showed that in any market, entrepreneurs, business people will have some incentives to produce useful things, to create genuine value. These are the the, the bees in my uh, my language. But there's always also incentives to be predators, to exploit, to extract people, to create monopolies. And in some ways, you can see the history of capitalism has always been a bit of a tension between these tendencies to predatory exploitative behavior on the one hand, but also its enormous capacity to generate wealth, to create new ideas, new technologies. And I argue a lot of the the reasons we had the crisis in the last decade was that the predatory side of capitalism became much stronger relative to its creative side. Uh, And in essence, what we need to do now is, is the opposite. So how, how, what, it, what brings about the ascendancy of this predatory capitalism? I'm thinking of, uh, obviously, uh, the kind of origins of the crisis were driven out of a lot of the practices in the financial sector, Wall Street, uh, at City, uh, in London. Was the ascendancy of those practices, do you see that as simply a case of kind of rampant deregulation? Or do you also see a kind of problematic and flawed ideology or intellectual system attached to propping a kind of predatory brand of capitalism you're talking about? Well, this isn't the first time it's happened. Sure. In the most recent wave, it was finance, which became particularly uh, predatory by the middle of the 2000s in, in, U- in the U.S., Finance was taking nearly half of all corporate profits. It was extracting value on a massive scale from the real economy. Uh, and it was doing so partly because it had rigged the, the rules of the game through lobbying and politics, as well as influencing you know, the ideologies of how economies uh, were run. Um, in other periods, the predation has, has had its roots in, in other places, sometimes within the mainstream economy, when business sort of took advantage of its, of its workers or of consumers. Uh, at other times, the most important predatory behaviors have been of the economy on, on the planet and, and on nature. And th- these are inherent dynamics. And I argue in the book, they always will t- there will always be a tendency towards predatory behavior in any system, just as there will be in societies where people, unfortunately, tend to take advantage of others unless they're held back by rules, by social norms. And the history of civilization, in some ways, has been the history of how we've learned to stop predatory behaviors, whether it's by warlords or gangs, or for that matter, matter people you know, exercising domestic violence in the home. And the economy is no different from that. There will always be tendencies to predation unless we're vigilant, unless we put in place uh, the rules, the social norms, the cultures, which make it, it difficult. Yeah, so this is kind of, you're talking very broadly and kind of holistically about how to respond to this. And I'm wondering, I I think that this is a good launching point for you to kind of get into more of some of the distinctions you're talking about. I know on this program uh, and in a lot of the public debate taking place in the United States and in Europe, which I think is an important debate, it's certainly the the argument between stimulus or austerity, uh, certainly I would, this show has a very strong uh, stimulative 
uh, position and a strong critique of austerity. But it seems to me that some of the things you're pointing to, uh, you, you probably have a view of that debate. But you're getting, um, you're trying to get to another place because it's not just a question of sort of shrinking the deficit, slashing services, or just stimulating anything for the sake of stimulating and investing. It's a question of what we're stimulating, what we're investing in, and using this crisis as an opportunity. Yeah, ex exactly. And I think there's there's two ways in which the debate post 2008 has gone wrong or rather settled into very comfortable, familiar positions, which I don't think are very helpful. So one polarity is the one which is between people who say all markets are good, capitalism is always good, and people who say all markets and all capitalism is bad. That debate dominated much of the 20th century. It's in a way revived since the crisis, but it's not actually that helpful because the real question, I argue, is what kinds of capitalism, what kinds of economy, what kind of market do you want to promote and which kinds do you want to constrain? Uh, and the same applies to the stimulus, which in in a way was the obviously the, the Keynesian debate of the 30s and 40s. And it's a very important practical argument in each country, though with slightly different conditions in each country, how much should you uh, uh, put cash, put spending power into the economy. But again, I think it's the wrong question long term. The right question is exactly as you put it, is what things do we want to grow and what things do we want to shrink? And that takes you to a much finer grained uh, and more detailed discussions about how you, you regulate the fi finance, how you regulate banks, which sectors you want to grow and in what way, rather than just pouring money into often the old industries and often the, the, the industries which were failing before the crash. And the great risk of, I think, a, a sort of simplistic stimulus positions is they actually prop up precisely the parts of the system which were most in crisis even before the financial crash hit. So bailing out you know, the, 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 the core industries of the old economy, which often are the best connected, the most politically influential, rather than growing uh, the sources of, of future prosperity. Right. So, so that's, this is interesting. And then, and then would you say, uh, actually briefly on this, would the, the kind of converse of that would be with austerity, that you're just not making funds available? Because obviously government is a part, if you're talking about a kind of broad, multi-sector approach, you do need government investment and government participation in spurring some of the innovation you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, the, the U.S. has been a, an innovation superpower for 50 or 60 years, in large part because of massive public investment since the Second World War in, in computing, in aerospace, in, in a whole host of other industries. And there's no doubt in my mind that we need to take those sort of models a step further, the kind of investment in innovation you see in countries like Finland or Taiwan or Israel or Korea, which are now becoming the, the sort of dynamos of the 21st century economy. They're investing in R&D, they're investing in science, but they're also backing the new growth sectors. Uh, and I show in, in, in the book that if you look for the next 10, 20, 30 years, which sectors will grow most is not going to be ones like uh, cars. Cars will remain important, but they'll almost certainly shrink as a share of GDP, whereas sectors like health, uh, care for the elderly will grow. The creative economy, we've done a lot of work on analyzing it. It's growing about four times faster than the economy uh, as a whole. Uh, the public sector is going to become increasingly important as a, sect as a, as a field of innovation itself because otherwise it becomes a drag on society and a drag on the economy. So many of the, the frames of the past debate, which were all about things like cars and infrastructure and bailing out banks, in many ways were looking at our economy in a sort of static, backward-looking way, not thinking about what type of economy, what kind of jobs do we want a generation hence. So this, this makes a lot of sense to me in, in a very broad sense, and I want to get into more specific details of where you see... Uh, some of this really promising innovation happening um, across sectors. But going back to the to the auto bailout briefly, because I, I think may, maybe we have some genuinely different perspectives on it, but I think it also gets to the heart of what's difficult about making the transition to some of the more type of long-term thinking that we really need to do and what you're advocating for, which is that, and, and I think in some respects, you know, President Obama did attach some uh, new environmental standards and some new efficiency standards with the auto bailout. But it certainly was the case that if that, bail that if that had not happened, 
the economic uh, crisis, depression in the United States would have just, uh, would have been exponentially even worse than it already was. So, and I, and I think that that's, and even with the banks, which maybe I'm more critical of that bailout, there was, as you know, I mean, there was really the potential of maybe you can't get money from your ATM for a period, you know, things were at this real crisis point, as you know. When governments and institutions generally are responding so quickly to these very real but very immediate crises, and maybe they don't feel the cognitive or organizational ability to even think in these longer terms, how, how do you strike that balance, I guess? How do you speak to that dynamic? I think that's one of the biggest challenges for any government. I, I spend quite a lot of my time advising ministers and prime ministers on, on strategy. And always they have to deal with the world as it is. They have to deal with crises as they emerge. And what governments did in the few years after 2008 was in some ways an extraordinary assertion of the virtues of active government responding very fast on an extraordinary scale and in very flexible ways to the meltdown of the financial system. And so I, I don't knock uh, Obama for the auto bailout. What I think is the sad thing about what's happened in the last five or six years is having been so phenomenally effective in the short term responses to crisis, governments around the world have been much, much worse at using the crisis to lay the long-term foundations for a different kind of economy. So just taking cars as an example, all sorts of things happening around existing car industries, about the shift to self-driving cars, but also around the world, the proliferation of new car sharing platforms, the collaborative consumption economy, which says you don't actually need to buy a car. You can you know, share your cars with your neighbors and, and rent uh, as you need it. And that's a completely different way of thinking about the economy than the post-war economy, which is all about every individual, every family, only one, two or three cars, and then with SUVs getting them uh, ever bigger. And, and I would look to political leadership to be yeah, bailing out industries like the car industry if there's a, a, a viable package, but putting a lot of resource as well into nurturing the future versions of the car economy, which, as I say, will, I think, in large part be, uh, on, on one hand, self-driving, automated, and on the other hand, much more collaborative and much more shared than, than, than I was brought up to expect. Yeah, or, or, uh, or, or even me, maybe, as someone who's a bit younger, not too much younger, but uh, maybe me as well. But that, so collaborative consumption, uh, that, that's one example. That's really interesting. What what are some other areas that when you talk about uh, the innovation uh, economy, more sustainable, more collaborative, whatever other words uh, may be appropriate, what are, what are other examples of this kind of concretely manifested that you would point to? Well, in one of the chapters in the book, I look at the shift which you can see happening all over the world from an economy mainly focused around commodities, the sale of things, of stuff like cars or, for that matter, iPads and so on, towards an economy where much more value lies in relationships. Uh, and it's an economy where often we're trying to maintain things to keep them good rather than just consuming things. Now, that may sound very abstract, but let me give you two or three examples. First of all, healthcare. Health is, I think, 17% of GDP in the US, so far and away the biggest sector. And it's the one everyone expects to become ever bigger over the next few decades. Now, you can think of the health economy as all about selling stuff, selling you know, drugs or new devices. But in fact, most of that 17% is care, is people doing things for other people. And increasingly, it's going to be caring for people with long-term conditions like uh, diabetes or, or cancers, which are not fatal but last for a long time. Uh, and whereas maintaining the body, maintaining the mind becomes a much more important part of health than just uh, uh, delivering commodities. You can say, see the same in relation to the green economy. Part of the green economy is about selling LED light bulbs and you know, new stuff, which is uh, uh, more environmentally friendly. But a large part of it is about how we look after things, how we look after buildings, how we look after land, how we look after animals. And many of the jobs of the future green economy are much more that kind of guardianship maintenance helped by much smarter technologies to, to track emissions and, uh, uh, and analyze data. But in some ways, 
more similar to almost a pre-industrial economy than the very commodity-driven, consumption-driven economy of the 20th century. Uh, and in all of those cases, relationships, the quality of relationships is key to value. And of course, this is already blindingly obvious in the social media, uh, in Facebook, in Google, in Twitter. You know, a lot of the, the, the value being created around their IPOs and so on is essentially a, a guess that the value of understanding relationships, tracking them, measuring and so on them is more important than the value of just producing and selling commodities. Absolutely. How how does the, you know, all of this is happening in all of these areas and I think, you know, examples of what you're talking about are just proliferating everywhere. I mean, I, you know, I live in Brooklyn and they kind of it's made, it's kind of almost become a bit of a comedy and easy to make fun of at this point. But in other ways, it's great. The kind of proliferation of, you know, do-it-yourself culture and food and business and small startups and in, in art, you know, across a variety uh, of platforms and, and, and businesses and artistic outlets. Uh, it, so it, this is obviously very prevalent, very important, and is going to lead to a lot of good. And then on the other hand, we see this kind of, spike, uh, certainly in the United States, we're overwhelmed with the question of inequality, uh, stagnant mobility, um, and just kind of serious gaps uh, in kind of basic access. And then we haven't seen, as an example, social media, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the kind of the, the tangible rewards of those platforms are going to very few hands in very few sectors. So how does that, the, the kind of inequality question, start to get addressed in this economy that we're talking about? I think that's going to be the, the central question of the next few years. Because as you were implying, these new sort of green shoots of a new kind of economy in food or the arts or health, they're still relatively small. They're growing fast, but they're, uh, they're, they're still not strong enough and of a sufficient scale to replace the dominant systems. And therefore, they're not generating enough opportunities for millions and millions of people in countries like the US uh, or, or the UK. And that's why I think pol politicians have to both try and fix the present and lay the grounds for, uh, for the future. For my, for my money, though, um, what we need is as energetic innovation around equality and opportunity as we've had perhaps on these issues like um, health and education and food. So just to give two or three examples of, of things I'm involved in, which uh, I hope are practical answers. Yeah. One is to change the school system. So we've, we've been creating new networks of schools here in the UK and in other countries, which try to address what's turned out to be one of the key aspects of, in, of educational inequality in modern societies, which isn't just unequal access to good maths and good science and good English, but also to the cultural capital, the ability to, to, to work in teams, to be creative, to be entrepreneurial. And so, for example, in the network of studio schools, which I spent most of last week with, we're creating a new kind of school very much aimed at uh, traditional working class industrial areas to try and help teenagers in those areas be much more prepared for the kind of jobs being created in the new sectors. We're looking at new ways of organizing capital. As you say, the capital rewards from this new economy have been incredibly narrowly uh, uh, distributed to a handful of really lucky investors in California and elsewhere. And so we need to move to much better ways of sharing ownership in, in the new economy, uh, giving people of, of all kinds a, a stake uh, in the new. Uh, and in sectors like health, which is uh, health and, and care for the elderly, which are bound to expand in terms of numbers of jobs. We need a very different sort of mindset to help um, people, particularly men, uh, get reasonable opportunities in those sectors, but also to regulate them so they provide reasonably secure jobs with reasonable prospects of pensions and training and so on, rather than the, uh, here we call it the zero hours contract, the, the very insecure, utterly deregulated sectors, which perversely have the result that care for us in old age, which should be something which matters enormously to us, that we are cared for well, we treat as almost the least important job in our society, whereas fiddling with finance, um, right. we pay enormous rewards. So we've got, we've got our values completely uh, 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 upside down. 
Absolutely, and that that's a that's a very large uh, area of of, uh, of labor organizing in the United States. In fact, is uh, home care work and things like that. So there's definitely a parallel there. As we begin to wrap up this conversation, take, taking going back to the sort of philosophical orientation of your book and this whole conversation, I you know I've been thinking a lot about uh, uh, Car- uh, Carl Polanyi recently. Uh, and the the notion that he he got at of saying that you know the problem was was when when society started working for markets and markets no longer worked for society or something to that effect that's certainly a simplification but that that's one of the kind of driving points he was getting after or another guy like E.F. Schumacher who talked about scale who talked about recognizing different values into an economy in addition to all of the practical uh, and actionable things you're talking about is a kind of philosophical or ideological shift of what we value uh, and how we organize uh, these frameworks. Is that as necessary for laying these groundworks as, uh, as anything else? I think it's always the case that getting to the right questions matters even more than getting to the right answers. Uh, And it's the frame with which our societies think about how to think about the economic crisis and the way out is, is for me, the top priority now. And that's why just thinking of it in terms of pumping more liquidity or money or stimulus into an otherwise unchanged economy does not sound very satisfactory to me. And for me, the key is exactly as you say, how do we get back to thinking of the economy as a servant of the things we care about, the servant of our values, the servant of society? And if we can get a more so rigorous debate about the locusts and the bees, so that we watch out for those areas of economic activity, those behaviors which are predatory in nature, and we make it normal to try and constrain them and regulate them and prevent them, and that we're equally energetic in looking out for the bees, the creative people creating value, and we get the barriers out of the, their way, allow them to, 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 to generate ideas and wealth. That's that's the route to a, a much better society. And it's very interesting here in the UK, just in the last six months, we've seen a big shift of public debate where both um, the major parties are now competing to tackle predatory behaviors in the economy, whether that's by energy companies charging overly high prices, payday loan companies exploiting uh, vulnerable poorer people. In a way, I've not seen for a generation, we've got both sides realizing that if they're not serious about stopping predation, they won't be credible for the public. What's still slightly missing though, is equally energetic policies and ideas about how to, to generate creativity and innovation without that. We will obviously have a stagnant economy long into the future. Absolutely. Uh, Jeff Mulgan is the author of The Locust and the Bee, Predators and Creators in Capitalism's Future. It's a very important, very interesting book that covers and obviously goes far beyond the conversation we've just had. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you very much. 